Hello legends. In this video, I'm gonna give you three tips for how to make your NAN workflows production ready. We'll be speaking about security, so how to secure your workflows so that not everyone can access them, and also how to secure your like API calls and credentials. We'll speak about how to introduce retry mechanisms into your workflows, so if like an AI agent step or a HTTP call fails, how do you actually retry that instead of breaking the flow straight away? And then finally, we'll be looking at how to handle errors and how to do error logging. So I actually have four tips, but it sounded better to say three for the YouTube title. If you stick around to the end of the video, I'm gonna show you tip number four as well. And actually this one comes from my background when I was doing coding and programming, all using AI. So if you're brand new to using no code tools like NAN, uh, this is gonna be a bit of a surprise to you, but it's gonna save you so many headaches down the line. Okay, so we're across on a brand new NAN canvas. And the first security that I want to speak about is actually when you're setting your trigger. So when you're actually building out your workflow for the very first time, you'll most likely be using either a um, manual trigger where you execute manually, or you might be using something like a chat trigger, and then you can kind of feed this into your AI agent step. So this is a very common way to just, you know, build out your workflows, test them out. But when you want to run this on a production environment, you actually get rid of these triggers and you might use something like a webhook. So a webhook is probably one of the most common ways that people use uh, or start their workflows. And traditionally, you can actually just set your webhook like this. Well, let's say we just change this to a post method. I'm gonna copy this webhook URL, which is just the address that I can target to hit this workflow and start it. So now I'm across in cursor, which is just an AI coding tool. And all I'm doing is just making an API call across to that NAN webhook. So I've got the URL of the webhook over here, and it's a post request. And if I just fire this off, and I'm just gonna go node test. Awesome, so workflow has started. And now back in NAN, we can see that we actually have some data over here. And if I scroll down, we have hello N8N, which is the same message that I sent across from cursor. But now the issue with this is that any one of you watching this video can actually just replicate this exact same API call and hit my NAN workflow, which means there's no security in who actually is able to target it and interact with it and use it. So now what we wanna do is actually put a lock on this workflow so that unless you have the special key, you cannot get inside. And to do that, we can go across to this authentication dropdown. We can go to header auth and we can just create a new credential. So I'm gonna drop down here and just go create new credential. So now what I can do is actually just establish some headers for the API call. I can set an API key header and an API key value that will act as the special key to open up this NAN workflow. And then back in cursor, I'll actually have to add that header to my API call. So let's go ahead and put x dash API dash key. Another value which I can't actually show you is actually just a word that says super, super secret one, two, three. Now, before we save this, let's just rename this Bartek header. Let's hit save. Let's close this. And now let's open up for a test event. And now back in cursor, I'm just gonna retry this exact same thing. So once again, note that I don't have the extra header over here with the secret password to get into that NAN workflow. I'm just gonna hit enter and let's see what happens. Okay, so the authorization data is wrong and my NAN workflow is still waiting for an event to be sent to this webhook. So this actually worked. I have a password now and I can only access it if I have that password key. Okay, so now I've actually added the API key header. So this should give me access to the NAN workflow. And just once again, this is literally just the password that I put in for the credentials. Super, super secret, one, two, three. Uh, if you wanted to, you can just use chat GPT to generate a better um, API key for you. Let's go to node test. Let's hit enter and let's see what happens. Okay, so workflow has started. And there we go. We have the information in our webhook. So that's literally how easy it is to add some authentication into your webhook so that this is your first line of security, your first line of defense against someone trying to access your workflow that shouldn't be accessing your workflow. So now the second thing I wanna speak about, I'll just get rid of this agent step, is using uh, API calls. So let's say we open up this HTTP request node. Now, typically when you're making an API call, just like what we did for the NAN webhook, you actually need, let me just put a dummy URL here, you actually need some kind of authentication. So typically you will send a header which is like authori whoops, authorization. And then you need some value for the API key. Now, as much as possible, we actually want to avoid putting the actual value into this placeholder. And there's two ways that we can avoid that. So the first way is that you can actually create predefined credential types for your uh, API calls. So let's say this was going across to OpenAI to some specific endpoint. I can go down to this authentication tab. And since I already have authenticated my OpenAI account, so I can use a brain from my AI agent, I can just go down to your predefined credential type and I can just search up OpenAI 
And now I have OpenAI established as my credential for this API call, and I no longer need this authorization header. So if I just remove that authorization completely, and I was to make this API call, assuming that all the other uh, settings were correct, the parameters were correct, I would actually success successfully execute this API call. But now the second way that you can actually do this is to use this authorization header, but then put a placeholder value into here, which will replace with the actual API key. So then what we will do is just get a set node, use the set node, and then manually map the API key into a variable. So we have API key, that's our variable. And now the API key, let's just say QWERTY12345. And now whenever we just insert this variable into the HTTP node or anywhere else in our flow, it'll just be replaced by this value, which is QWERTY12345. So let's actually just execute this. So it's available for the HTTP node. Let's join this up. And now we would just go into our value for the authorization and we would just bring this into here. So this is a second layer of defense. Um, the ultimate is actually just to do the predefined credential type. So go for predefined or generic credential type. Um, but yeah, this is the second best way to do this so that you only have the variable and it's inserted when you're making the API call. Okay, so that was tip one done. We just spoke about security. Now let's go across to tip number two and speak about retries. So when it comes to retries, this is most applicable when we're interacting with third party API services from the NAN canvas. In this instance, we have the AI agent that might have to interact with OpenAI or Anthropic or Google for the AI brain. We might give the agent tools, for example, Gmail, so it can actually send an email to someone. We might be making raw API requests using the HTTP node, or we might use any other number of pre-built nodes for NAN, for example, this Airtable node. So there are three main issues that we can run into. The first is if the actual provider is having some downtime. So if Gmail is down, then no matter what we do with this AI agent, we're just not gonna be able to interact with this and it's gonna keep erroring out for us. Same thing with Airtable. If Airtable is down, we're also gonna be getting an error in this workflow. So that's not super, super common, but it does happen sometimes. Another one is sometimes API calls just fail. So let's say we're hitting this OpenAI endpoint over here. Even if OpenAI is up and running, sometimes just the API call will just bug out and we have to just retry it one more time in order for it to work. And in this case over here, we're using an LLM. So if we don't have enough credits on our account, then the LLM is just gonna bug out. So the appropriate error handling over here is to actually implement some retry mechanism. So if you go across to your AI agent to implement a retry over here, and this is very similar for a lot of different nodes in NAN, is to go down to here and just click retry on fail. So from my experience, whenever you have an error with like some kind of LLM step, so either hitting open AI or even just hitting an API, it's typically enough just to retry one more time and that'll solve like 60 or 70% of the possible issues that you can run into. If the API call randomly just bugs out, then you hit it again and it works. Or sometimes you might hit an API call and you might get rate limited. It might say, hey, you have too many requests coming in for this specific minute, wait another five, 10 seconds and you can go again. So to counter that, you can just set your time between retries to be a little bit longer. Right now it's set to one second, but it doesn't hurt if you just set it to five seconds as well. So this just means if you run into an error, it'll wait five seconds before retrying and then it will wait two more times as well. So the total amount of time you can wait is 15 seconds. And usually within 15 seconds, if you hit any rate limits or if your API call just bugged out randomly for that first time, this will actually solve that issue. Now, a really good fallback, which I got from Retail AI, which is the uh, AI phone provider, is to actually do uh, continue using error output. So what these guys actually offer is a fallback LLM in case something happens with the main provider that you're using. So in this case, what you actually can do um, with your error node over here is just build out an entirely new AI agent step. So let's go, we go into this AI agent step, but now you replicate it using a different provider. So let's go to Anthropic, and then let's just say for your Gmail, um, maybe either just do a completely different method, or maybe for now you just kind of log this across to your Slack, and it might just go into your DM, and it might say, hey Bar, um, we tried to use the previous workflow, we had an error with the Gmail module, or you know the entire thing didn't work, um, can you please send this email on our behalf? So now your retry sequence is to try this specific setup three times, and if it doesn't work after three times, it must mean there's some kind of critical fault with either the OpenAI step or the Gmail step. And now instead of just bugging out and kind of ending the workflow, you have a secondary fallback, which goes to a totally different LLM provider and a totally different tool step. And with this fallback, you actually have the exact same prompt. You pass in the exact same value into here so that if you do fall back into here, it's the exact same experience on your output. And then let's say you wanna merge these two nodes together. Actually, one thing I do is use the do nothing operation node. This is different to a merge node in the sense of 
Um, this actually just takes whatever the live line is, it takes the live line and it pushes it through. For our scenario, we will never ever take the success and error path at the same time. We're only gonna take one of these paths. So all we need to do is just push whatever the live like the live wire, the live information is, we just need to push it through. So I'm not gonna to go too deep into this node, but it is my favorite node for just getting the live wire and pushing it. And then you just continue your workflow from here. So whatever other steps you need, you would just put them after this. And now in the same way that we did the retry for the AI agent, you can go into all these different nodes. For example, this API call over here, you can scroll down and the same thing you can do, retry on fail, max retries, you can do five, uh, zero, zero, zero for five seconds. And you can take this error workflow over here using the error output. So you can actually build your workflows out considerably to be able to handle like any errors that come up. But now if you are building out your workflow before you put it into production and it's actually working in your test environment, chances are that it is gonna keep working in production. So you might not always need these error outputs over here, but the best fail safe, the, the, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is just to do this setup over here, just to do retries. And once again, this is absolutely everywhere. So if we go into this Airtable node, we go into settings, we go retry on fail, and we just bring this up to five zero zero zero, and that's five seconds. Okay, so that's tip one and two done. And now let's go across to tip number three on how to deal with errors. So for tip number three, I'm just gonna be breaking down some of the sequence. I don't wanna be using this anymore. Now we're gonna be using a native built-in error handling node from NAN. So I'm just gonna type in error over here. We've got two different nodes. We have the error trigger, and we have the stop and error node. So the first thing we're gonna be doing is actually building a second workflow that uses this error trigger. Okay, so I've just split screen. So this is my second workflow called error workflow. And I'm just gonna go add step. I'm gonna find that error trigger that we have over here. And there we go. So now in order for us to link this specific workflow to this trigger, we're just gonna go back to the workflow number one. I'm just gonna get out of this side panel. I'm gonna go to my top nav bar. I'm gonna slide across until I have these three buttons. I'm gonna go to settings. And now over here where it says error workflow, all I'm gonna do is find this workflow name, which is called error-workflow. Just gonna type in ERR. There we go, we have error-workflow. And now when I hit save, anytime this main workflow bugs out, even in its current environment, every time it bugs out, it's gonna send a packet of information across to this trigger, which is gonna contain information about the failure of this workflow. Now, keep in mind, this is only gonna work when I switch this to production. So right now in this testing environment, if I manually try and error it out, it is not gonna flow into here. So for us to test this out, we actually have to flick it across to live. So I'm gonna build out something very basic for now just for us to be able to test this. And actually one cool thing I'm gonna do is, before I had this error output go to a totally different AI agent, which I still think is a very good idea to kind of switch LLM providers and switch tools up. But if you wanted to, you can go to this error, type in error again, and then we have that second node that we had before. I'm gonna go stop and error. So this stop and error is actually gonna be able to interact with this workflow. And what we get to do here is actually send a custom message. So I can send here um, error in workflow. But what I might actually want to do instead is to actually put into this node the specific point of failure. So since we're coming out of this AI agent step, I can actually go into here and I can say error in workflow at agent step. And now when it sends across, I'm gonna be able to get that message into this error trigger. And then you can see from here, if you actually had a different workflow, like for example, going to this HTTP request, you can once again go into here, click on stop and error. And then your message might be uh, error at HTTP node. And the value of this is that you can quickly and easily see exactly where the point of failure is. So we're, we're gonna be plugging this into a Google Sheet and we're gonna be able to see exactly what the message is and know exactly where the fault is. So if I open up this AI agent step, I've got my settings panel over here for the AI agent, and I can already see that the user message input is red. And that's because we're not using a chat input. In theory, I should actually change this to define below and pull in the value from the webhook, but this is gonna cause an error output for us. And that means that when we actually ping this workflow, it's gonna take the error path, and we're gonna see this error message, which is error in workflow at agent step, appear in here. Okay, so let's move this across to active to put it into production. Okay, I got it. And now let's get the production URL for this webhook back in cursor. I'm just gonna replace this test URL with the actual production URL. I've got my original API key here as well. So now everything is set up. I don't have to go back into the workflow and hit test workflow because it's the production URL. I'm just gonna test it automatically. So node test and let's see workflow was started. Now if I go across to the executions, there we go. That was the most recent execution and we took the stop and error path. And now if I go from my error trigger to my executions tab over here, I have the most recent error over here. 
Let's open that up. And looking at the message, error in the workflow at the agent step. So now in order for us to make this effective for our workflow, let's go across and add a Google Sheet step. Let's go append row and sheet. And over here, I've got a sample Google Sheet when we were logging the workflow ID, the workflow name, the URL of the actual execution. So if I click it, it's gonna take me to the executions tab. And then the error message. So for example, that stop and error message was error at the agent step. So I've got the document selected, workflow logging, and all I need to do is actually manually log this stuff. So from my error trigger, I had the execution URL, let's just paste it into here. Then scrolling down to the very bottom, I've got the workflow information over here. So the workflow ID, let's pop it into here. The workflow name, let's pop it into here. And now scrolling up a little bit, I have the message, which is the error in the workflow step. So I'm just gonna bring this and put that into here. And now if we execute this step, it should transfer across to Google Sheet. Okay, awesome, it looks like it was successful. There we go, we have the information over here. All right guys, and now we're at the end of the video. And the final thing I wanna show you is actually this bonus, which I cannot remove this thing anymore, but it is version control. So now the concept of version control is very simple, but it is gonna save you so much time and so much hassle down the track. So the idea is that once you've finished your actual workflow and you've tested it out and you've pushed it into production and now it's ready to go, all you need to do is actually just create a naming convention so for example, here I've got production ready. I'm just gonna add a dash and V1. So this denotes this as a version one. I'm gonna hit enter so the workflow is saved. So then I'm gonna download this workflow. I'm gonna to go to download. So then I'm gonna go across to Google Drive. I'm gonna go into my nan-workflows folder, which is currently empty. And I'm gonna drop that workflow directly into here. So now let's say I'm running this workflow and then I decide to make some changes to it. I wanna add some more nodes over here. And let's say for example, I add something like a Google Sheets node, but imagine that this workflow is now completely different to the original workflow that I had. Sometimes it's not gonna be easy for me to revert back to a previous workflow version, especially if there's multiple people on the account and actually multiple people doing totally different things for this workflow. So that means all I would do is I would come into here, I would put this as workflow V2, then I would hit save, then I would go back into Google Drive, I would download this workflow, I'd go into a brand new canvas, I'd click these three buttons, I'd go import from file, then I would import that workflow. And there we go. We have the production V1 ready to go and use again. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed these four tips for how to make your workflows production ready in NAN. If you want to see more content like this, or if you've got other tips and tricks to make your workflows more production ready, please share them in the comments below. And if you've watched to the very end, I'd appreciate if you could like the video, drop a comment. And if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. And you'll help me push this video out to more people, which will help more people learn about how to improve their workflows and it will also help me grow my channel. All right, guys, enjoy your production-ready workflows. See ya.